This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Then we're on. And yeah. today's guest, we've got Dan Southwell. Dan, how are you? Brilliant to meet you after all this time, James. Yeah, we've been back and forth with messages. You know, a few people that's been on the show. But you've got a fascinating so- story yourself. You've done nearly 30 years in prison. Um, you murdered your mum's abusers. Uh, your mum's abuser, which is probably any son or any any brother or any father would probably do anything to protect their mum. Yours went out of hand and you've done a 30 stretch. But first and foremost, how's things? Life's all right. Could be better. How so? But uh, better housing and stuff. I would touch on that whenever. But uh, as a whole, nah, life's better than being caged behind the fucking door. Yeah. <laughs> How are you enjoying Glasgow? Brilliant. Yeah. First time I've been here. Brilliant. Is it just first? like a dirty version of Manchester City said so <laughs> <laughs> Is this the first you've been out in Manchester? Yeah, far as I've been is in a cave on. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into everything, Dan, I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Get yeah. a bit of information about you, where you grew up, how it all began. Uh, grew up in Manchester. Uh, East Manchester, Clayton, New and Heath, around them areas. Uh, started off in life with twin sister and two older sisters. And uh, mum and dad... Mum and dad separated when I was around about seven. Me and my twin sister and my two older sisters stayed with my dad. My mum went off with a new fella uh, two, three years into their relationship. My mum had twins to uh, this man. And that's where the story sort of, sort of starts. Ever at school? Yeah, uh, I missed the last year of secondary school. I had no interest in school, really. Uh, Pretty sharp learning in, in them days. More interested in motocross bikes, more than anything cars. Uh, had a brain, I had a car crash when I was 15, 105 mile an hour car crash. Uh, turns out I had a bit of a brain injury, head injury. Uh, that never got sort of discovered until 18 years later, sort of thing. So, yeah, my mum's relationship with a fella, Rocky from the word go, you know what I mean? But being a seven, eight, nine year old kid, you don't really recognise it, you know what I mean? But as you get a bit older and older and older, you start seeing it and you start realising the cupboard door odds and broke, fucking smashed the door, eye in or anything like that, you know what I mean? So yeah, my mum's relationship was rocky with her fellow, but on the other half, my dad, best man you could ever wish for, brought, brought four and six kids up, my dad worked his ass off, died 60 years old, right out of the blue with cancer. So that was a massive loss to my life, you know what I mean? Uh, missing all them years with my dad hurts. Uh, so yeah, I grew up with my dad, uh, with my four sisters, me, I won't class them as stepbrother and sister, the brother and sister, simple as that. They lived with me mum and dad, uh, with me mum. Uh, then, I get to, my mum leaves this guy at, I think I'm around about 14, 
But from 14 to 18, stroke 19, he's still going around giving me mama crack. He's threatening to take Sally and Scott to uh, Scotland, where he's from, unfortunately. Oh, Crosley. Uh, he was threatening to take the two twins to Scotland and probably capable of doing it. Reckless guy. Uh, he kept on beating me, man, from the from like I say another four years after they broke up. Mum used to pull the police in and say, "I'll be all right once he's sobered up." So on and so on. He had a bit of a rep in this area, uh, a bit of an hard guy, known locally, funny enough, as Mad Jock. Uh, not much imagination in that one, but uh, yeah, he was a bit of a vicious guy. You know what I mean? And I was just like an 18, 19 year old kid getting on with life. That was it, basically. Were you violent beforehand? Or were you in and out of prison before? In no. Boston or anything? No, didn't lead that type of life. Been in been in trouble with the police, uh, car related and stuff like that. Pair, pair. Uh, one wound in charge. Got someone breaking in my car. They got a crack. They went moaning to the police. Uh, criminal long as the arms anyway. Uh, but got six month probation or something stupid like no prison sentence. So never been to prison before this life sentence. Uh, no, no violence apart from that. Uh, Section 20 wounded, I think it was, like I say, serious, but not serious enough to warrant a prison sentence. Uh, but had a car crash when I was 15. The oldest sister seemed to be the only one who recognised there was a change in me. More snappy, more volatile, more standoffish, that type of thing, won't back down. So, night in question, I say he's been smacking my mum around for the last four years. Police have done nothing about it. I'm getting a bit old, or I think it's my responsibility to look after my mum, like I've done my sisters, and so on. Uh, this night in question, I overhear my, my mum's out with her, my sisters and her mate. And his party trick used to be, he'd call around my mum's house, no answer, it don't matter, he'd presume she's out with the daughters, who wait in the garden when she comes rolling home at 12 or whatever, give her a slap, whatever. So, early on in the night, he's, uh, I overhear my mum talking that he's been round giving my mum a slap, that type of thing, and I just automatically oh, thought, I'm going to get my mum home that night in the taxi, simple as that. Uh, as I am doing so, my mum just give a flippant remark and said he's even had the cheek to fucking move there, near me mum. I pulled the taxi over, taxi driver was moaning, mum was moaning at me, me and my mum got out of the taxi. Uh, mum didn't want me to go and confront him, making things worse, but she was trying to deter me, as simple as that. I won't have none of it, my mum took off, the taxi took off because he got sick of waiting, my mum went. Uh, I didn't think he'd be in the house. I thought I'd wreck his house, piss him off, whatever. Give him a cause to have a pissed off with me rather than my mum's sort of attitude, you know what I mean? I say 18, not thinking clearly. Drink as well. Play the part, got to have. Uh, ended his house. Have a confrontation with him. Starts calling me an English bastard, you're not leaving, stuff like that. Goes to smack me, I, I smack him, he falls back into a chair. Goes fucking berserk, pick an hammer up, his hammer. And uh, sadly, yeah, beat him to death with it. Formed an ambulance, because he had no intent to go around and hurt anyone. Had the intent of standing up for myself if there was a confrontation there. But that was the last thing on my mind. Like I say, clouded with drink as well. 18 year old and not putting any spin on it or any blame on it, but facts are facts. I did have some kind of brain injury, so that did cloud how, how my brain operated, so I think, you know what I mean? So that would have affected me. Uh, even like medication, I had some medication, but I was on for a damaged hand. Shouldn't have drank with why you should have been on them. So things like that, I don't know, I'm not putting a spit, uh, blame on it. I'd made from day one, I did kill the guy, and on, end off, you know what I mean? So, please say to me, mother, do you think it's your son who's killed George? My mum's a staunch woman, my mum, you know, simple as that, right? 
use on the on your toe my mum would put you up all day James right so the police have just said to me mum do you think it's your son who's killed George and my mum said no Scott's only eight years old or seven years old left me right out of the equation I get nicked three days later or something he went he must have told him right she knew all about it blah 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 they nicked me mum with manslaughter I didn't even enter the fucking house. I know people who've stabbed someone to death and got done for manslaughter. How can my mum get done with that? So my mum gets done with manslaughter and perverting the cause of justice or something like that. Mum's in jail. Bear in mind, she got two twins of seven years, eight years old the day I got arrested. Uh, there was. So she's been taken away from them. Uh, then I get the most shittiest legal team you can imagine. Burton and Copeland solicitors, my macker. Saw me right down the river, gets me a QC, Enricus, Henry, Richard Enricus, or whatever you called, Lord. I don't know where, fucking Lord. But I met him once and he said, open and shut manslaughter case, blah, blah, blah. Simple as that. He'd be home in about six, seven. You're okay. Uh, go to court for trial. You get me to one side, so we struck a deal with the uh, CPS. You plead guilty to murder, your mum can go home. I'm not happy with it. But I also consider myself as not being in sound mind of making that judgment as well, considering the injury, what I started to realise they had a few years later. And what I mean by that is I told the court, when, when you nick for something serious, you get interviewed, court appointed psychiatrist. I sold him with a serious car crash and all he put in a report was Mr. Southward sold him with a serious car crash, brain damage, question mark. But it's too late in the day to take, chase anything up because the case goes in front of the Crown in two weeks' time. Now, when a Dr. Peter Pratt examined me 18 years later for a pro report, he was gobsmacked that I'd been in so long due to the circumstances and stuff like that. And he said that in, interviewing me for like, say, four hours, like he was getting paid for, he said, can he interview you all week sort of thing? And he did. And the load of tests and so on and so on. And his basically his findings was I would have been suffering from brain damage from at that area at that time. And it would have took around about three years to heal. And in that time, I would have been volatile, et cetera, et cetera. So I wouldn't have been in sound mind. Uh, I genuinely think in probably the law. And I've spoken to some people in the law. And they've all said... That would have been diminished responsibilities if that would have been known. Could have walked free for that, could have got two years for that. Uh, so I pleaded Gilly. This is where I think the judge was wrong. Judge pressed. He was shocked. He was absolutely shocked that one minute I'm going cut not Gilly all the way. From day one going not Gilly for murder. Simple as that. The moment of go to court trial, I've changed it. He was gobsmacked. What he should have done is stop proceedings, got everyone down downstairs and said, yeah, what the fuck's going on? What have you promised him? You know, he's changed from this to that. What he did do is he wrote in a statement saying, which is there, saying, I accept there was no intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. They sent me to for eight years. That eight years meant nothing. Ended up doing 29 years. I don't think there's many people who've done 29 years, who've gone out and planned, plotted, schemed to do a murder, where the judges wrote that, and they've done fucking 10, 15 years less than me. That bl blows my mind and it does make me bitter, but I won't let the bitterness get in the way, because like I say, met a gentleman in you today, you've not had an easy ride in your life, you, you've turned a corner, and that's what I'm here to do, you know what I mean? Nothing's going to defeat me. Simple as that. See, when you came out of that house, did you know he was dead? Yeah. Straight away? Mm. Yeah. And what's going through your mind then, once you know you've killed someone? Uh, oh, scared, you know? Thinking, fucking hell, I've just killed someone, that's a start. Uh, getting caught, ruining your own life, selfishly as it sounds, you've just took someone, but you do start thinking about yourself, you do, automatic. It is. Uh, yeah, not good. Knowing your life is going to be getting switched off for a very long time at any moment. And it did.
you know what I mean? And in that time, like I say, I went to jail as a kid, as a teenager, got dumped into the adult system, and which was one of the best things could have ever happened to me, in the sense. Landed at full sorting as a kid. They threw me on the worst wing. We called it Beirut. Met some of the best people in my life there. You know what I mean? So that set me in good stead. And I only said it recently to someone. They didn't take me under the wing. They had a lot of respect for me as a young age. And, but they did look after me without realizing it. You know what I mean? These was like, your top London lads and IRA lads and stuff like that. Like I say, met one, Brendan Dowd, beautiful Irish guy, beautiful man, you know what I mean? Uh, so I've seen a lot of lifers who were in for domestic crimes, domestic murders, never go to a dispersal. Cat B's, cat C's and D's type of thing. I had decades in the dispersal system, getting bounced around the dispersal system. Even though I had a tiny tariff, uh, I was never going to get out on my tariff because it's still a cat and shit where you couldn't get parole. That kind of scenario. You know what I mean? What was it like for you when you've done a murder, you've got a life sentence? What's it like in prison when the door gets shut for the first night? It's hard to explain it because it comes, becomes the norm, right? I've had people say to me, how the fuck did you get 330 years? I can't even explain it myself. And I said to me mate, Dale, one day, he said, how oh, did you get through it? And I said, the belief that something nice will come out at the end of it. Still not come yet, but I'm waiting. But that's the belief what got me through it. So I'd say whatever shit came my way, and I have had a hell of a lot of shit. Segregation units, I wasn't the best behaved prisoner, but I wasn't the worst. But you've also got to bear in mind as well, I'm in a fucking nut house full of craziness, no control of the system, dispersal systems, early night is run by the inmates type of thing, you know, ain't done what you wanted. But it was a good life, as in the best you was going to get. A mad life, but I'd rather do an army sentence in the dispersal rather than going down to these poxy cat seas any day of the week. Full of mugs, yeah, yeah, I'm on high risk. High risk meaning you can't share the fucking cell with someone because they bullied them or some bullshit. Now, high risk where you're getting fucking carried out from your cell every 28 days to another cell or move from all up from jail to jail. But if I could have done my sentence in dispersal all the way through, would have done it there all the time because of the quality of the people you was around, even though you are around some fucking monsters and some fucking proper shit kickers, you are around some of the best of the lads I've ever met and that's the easiest way I can describe it so see when you get an eight year tariff in your mind would you what how big a sentence do you think you would I have thought done I'd do about a 12 I thought I'd do about a 12 me yeah so how do you get an eight year tariff and then spend 30 years in prison that like, were you doing damage inside I've uh, yeah here's, a, here's an example I was in one jail waiting to go to a cat D some little shit kicking in, mate, is going to get, go in front of the adjudicator in two week, two days' time, like the outside judge, and get extra days. He's gone in there saying, I'm going to escape, all right? Don't need to escape. I'm in a fucking poxy jail going to a cat D in a few weeks, or hoping to go to a cat D. They've acted on it. They've moved in out of the jail so we don't go in front of the outside adjudicator. So in four days time, he's out, he's gone home. They've moved me to full sun <laughs> all over again. Got there, Pearson, security governor, said, do you remember me from years back? I said, yeah. He was a security governor now. He said, I can't believe what the police have said and fucking full, uh, the, the other jail have said, I'll have you out of here in no time. Spent another fucking six years there or something. You know what I mean? Four years, five years there, over so much shit like that. Then you can't get parole, then you're going on a parole here and try to defend yourself. You was going to escape. What? No, I won't. You know what I mean? So I've been in stripes a few times in full sun and places like that when I was a young lad. Yeah, nearly had that out of there. Me and someone who you interviewed 
we was thinking if it, we would have been on our way home, you know what I mean? Then they signed me up with some other, an IRA skate, uh, a foiled escape attempt. But me involved, now to do with me, I'm back down the block for fucking a year or something now for that. Now to do with me, wish I was part of it, you know what I mean? Would have been home. But yeah, notes in the box and little shit, things like that. And when you're going for parole, nitpicking, nitpicking over bollocks. He won't go to he won't go to work. So what? Try to be a wing cleaner and go to the gym every day. You know, and that type of shit. He won't work. Or oh, he's just told to screw the fuck off. Yeah, I'm having a bad day. Oh, we can't let him out. That kind of shit, you know what I mean? And here's the thing, right? I went on a pro hearing in full sun. A uh, psychiatrist for the pro board, Asia King, she was in a wheelchair, she was a cracking woman. So fair, first time I met her. Uh, judge and the pro board guy, they hammered the pro board at the prison service, made them look so stupid. The psychologist, he called out lying. Time he said, I've asked you 20 questions, or you don't need to lie. <laughs> you know what I mean? Told her straight, told me life for officer who was just sat on the fence, fucking with me life. And the nitpicking, I told her to fuck off one morning. Cause she's left the door wide open, some bullshit like she's giving me a right, right, you're not you shouldn't be going home. But because a bark barks at you for two minutes. Wake the fuck up. Uh and the pro board hammered the pr the system, hammered it. I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm gonna be the first inmate to go on from a dispersal as a lifer. Got to me interview me. Prisons said, Oh, you've got to stop the interview the pro area now, because we've been on it nine hours or something. So the judge said to me, don't worry, we're going to come back in six weeks' time. Everyone's going to be the same. All we're going to do is interview you. If your, interview, your evidence comes up to scratch, which I think it will, I think you'll be having a, a different December. Come sick me parole here in six weeks later, brand new parole here. Everything, all them lies, what the prison service said about me, they've just brushed them up and give evidence in a bit better way. So I got knocked back again. So I wrote to the judge, the same judge who was on the parole hearing six weeks earlier. And I basically said to him, if I don't fucking get out on my next parole hearing, I'm going to commit any fucking type of crime in jail. I'm going to go to court and I'm going to say, this is why I've done it. I'm going to have a load of convicted murderers who've been out, who've done atrocities 10 times worse than me, who've done 10, 10 years less than me. They're all going to say, can't you blame him snapping? Don't want to go through that role. You knew I was going home that last time. And summer, some spanner got put in the work somewhere. Everyone was shocked. Even the screws coming off my parole hearing said, you've got this, you've fucking had the, parole, the board, what you had. Smashed it, had him eating out of me and even praised me, saying, has anyone ever patted you on the back? I said, oh, what? He said, not being introduced, lies. I said, nah. He said, you think you're remarkable. Well, you've got through this, that and the other. Next minute, kept in prison, moved to a D, a C cat then, Buckley Hall, which was a good thing. Because as soon as I went on me, so all my pro hearings up until going to a cat C was seven hours, nine hours. Wrote that letter to the judge saying I'm pissed off with your underhanded what everything's been done. I'm going to expose it. I'm not going to say no shit anymore. Because I'm saying, listen, I've done 28 fucking years for fuck's sake. Eight year tariff. I know people who've done a 15 year sentence for an armed robbery as an adult, get out, do two contract killings. And do 10 years less than me and don't start getting me fucking started on political you know ira goes and blows an out on old tell up over here got nothing against the ira whatsoever met some of the beautifulest men in my life who are the ira the point i'm making is this fuck about politics someone's gone out and killed five people in a bombing campaign in this country four years before before me and he serves 13 years and i serve fucking over double Where's the injustice in that? Where's the, how, how disproportionate that is? And that's what eats away at me. How hard is that when you see people who's done worse than you doing 10 years less than you, 15 years less than I'm you? I'm glad they've got out. I don't mean these paedophiles and shit like that. Fuck them, they can rot, they can rot. I know you fucking grasses who are just selling people out just to get fucking lower sentences, but people I've met, all right, you're armed robbers and you're drug importers and stuff like that, even killers. 
some of the people are the best, nicest people I've ever met. They've just been caught up in a circumstance like me. You know, I don't class myself as a bad cunt. You know, I'm here with someone now who can justify. I had a fiver in my name one day, it in my pocket, and I chased after a bloke who had two, who just lost two grand, dropped it, and I chased after him and chased after him like fuck to give it him back. I had the best day of my life in that day. Good karma. I started learning that as an adult, because you've got to remember, I lost all my adult life being in prison. All my adult life has been spent in prison, being told what to do, when to do it sort of shit, or rebelling against it and then just being spent years down segregation units and stuff like that. No bed and all that carry on, you know what I mean? So, yeah, some of the best people I have met, good quality people, you know what I mean, who've took a wrong turn. What was it like your first year in Christmas? Doing a leafer? Horrible. Horrible. You know what I mean? I had a girlfriend recently when, we fought, when I went to prison that broke up that type of shit, which was expected anyway, obviously. But, you know, everything's brand new that first year. You know, you're going from a nice house with a fucking a toilet with a fucking a cell with a, a potter. Slopping out back Slopping then. Slopping out then. in them days, you know what I mean? No radio, no electrics and stuff like that. So, bare basics in them days. So a lot of people never experienced them prisons, you know what I mean? I'm glad they did. Uh, so yeah, Christmas is just comes and goes, you know what I mean? And, uh, but yeah, never thought I would have spent that many Christmases in jail, no way. But, never lost sight of getting out, but I started getting, getting to the attitude where fuck is, if I don't get out, I'd be a right nasty cunt to Orges. But that wouldn't have got me nowhere because you can't win the system. No, you can't beat the you system. You can't beat the system, and, you know what I mean? And I've seen so many good people die in the system, you know. Like I was watching some of the other week and oh, I had tears in my eyes, you know what I mean? Me, me cockney mate, Charlie Souza. had some good times with Charlie, man. And he got a big one, got out, got another big one. I don't know what happened, but he called it a day believe he killed himself so yeah i've met some really good beautiful people who yeah breaks me out breaks me out do you see a lot of suicide then i've seen a fair few yeah that is especially uh like you say the one that always sticks in my mind is as i say i was a young lad and uh Connie lad desi cunningham beautiful man you know what i mean if you went out with him he'd get all the birds and Top lad, staunch as you staunch, comes from a staunch family. All his brothers are staunch, don't know his brothers, but Desert used to cook for me, used to make me some lovely meals. Uh, yeah, I think he was doing it in 18 or something. He had like 18 months left and he killed himself. So don't know the circumstances about it. But yeah, that sticks in my mind now because I always seen if anyone like that can do it. You'd have him in your corner all day long, you know what I mean? One staunch guy. So if someone like him can do it, someone who I thought was so strong who, who could just do this sentence, like I say, at the end of his sentence as well. So if anyone can do it like him, we're all vulnerable in that sense. How many different jails have you been in, Dan? Oh, I bounced around about 35 or something, bounced around everywhere, so I think for years, you know, block to block and that type of stuff but uh just becomes a norm doesn't it what's the worst prison you've been in <coughs> forest bank forest bank where's that salford manchester what's the shit on private corruptest cunts i've ever met in my life sorry for swearing but i went in there when i was recalled for oh, a madhouse Corrupt as they come, bringing drugs in, phones in, screws. Now, if you're into that, sweet. But don't be writing fucking reports saying, keep me in prison because I'm up to no good, when you're fucking doing it yourself and using that uniform to justify it. Don't be doing that. And, yeah, listen, I'm seeing 22-year-old screws who haven't got a clue who was working in Sainsbury's six months, some months earlier, doing a report on my life and not giving a fuck. I want 
One day, there was a lad who was cutting his neck in his cell, about 19 year old. Cutting his neck, went over to a school, said, yeah, go and get him out. She went, fuck him and busy. I said, open the door, go and speak to him. No, because everyone will want that then. So there's no compassion for you. Uh, but obviously there's some good officers in there. Obviously I'm not going to tie everyone with the same brush and that's stupid. But uh, as a prison, as a whole, what was a shit all. How did you get on with this, Chris? Were you anti authority straight away as soon as you were on the Black Army all the time? At every prison, though, when no. did you start kind of going, wait a minute, some of that's uh, decent, or were you just against them because of the sentence that you got? Uh, 10 years, I'd say. 10 years of being, I won't say a loose cannon, but I also wouldn't say bad enough to justify spending years and years in jail. I had all my mis misdemeanors up in prison, I had them all up together. He won't even warrant six weeks in jail out here. Half of his charges don't exist. You know, getting a knockback for parole because you saw some fucking bell end officer to fuck off. You know what I mean? Don't justify keeping me in for another two years. Not in my eyes anyway. But, uh, yeah. Mad one. Back in the 80s, 90s, like the screws were ruthless. They used to kick fuck at you. Yeah. 50s, 60s, 70s. Did you feel that? Did you ever get any oh, beats yeah. from them? Yeah, all the blocks. Like I say, your full sun blocks, long line block, all in places. You know, strange ways they didn't fuck about with you. Forest Bank, they don't fuck about with you. They wrap you up for no fuck. I've, I've seen them batter people in that block, opening someone's legs and booting them in the bollocks while he's wrapped up. Shit houses, you know what I mean? Big muck. Big gym heads, big gym screws all muffed up, fat, firm handed going in over some eight stone weekly and beating fuck out of him. Shit houses. So I don't like that. No. What's the best prison you've been in? Uh, I'd say Buckley Hall as a prison as a whole. Best dispersal I've been in. I would have said. Full sewing. They all have the times. They all have the times, you know what I mean? Long Latin. Long Latin would have been the, the best in dispersal in the 90s, early 90s. Freedom, done what you wanted. Got paid in silver. Done what you wanted. Really what you wanted. But it wasn't a matter of control jail. It was long term, it's not one headaches. Don't want the, the wings getting spun and all the huge or whatever they're doing, getting found, do you want an easy life, you know what I mean? These ain't dickheads. So as a jail where you could just have a decent life, chill out, not have any aggravation with the screws, the state stayed away from you, we stayed away from them. I'd say long line in them days, yeah. But as a prison to get, like, just get your head down. Like I say, I can't class long line as the best prison to, as a whole to get out from. But for me, I'd say Buckley Hall. What's the longest you've spent in the block? Uh, about 18 months in one go. A few times in that, them stages, yeah. Garth Block was in there for about a year. Shit old. Yeah, I was in there for about a year. No daylight? Are you just, are you out? You get... Uh, full Sutton, when I used to get thrown down a strong box, you had like no window and shit like that. Throw you in there for fucking all sorts, you know what I mean? A body belt in the early days as well, which was outlawed. You know, give you a beating. That was the old block and the new block. Uh, yeah, all that one metre rule and all that bullshit. As soon as your door open, if you come within one metre, it gives you the right to jump all over you. But I don't know when at one metre. I don't walk around with a fucking ruler. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I only know two metres now because of COVID. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> But, but, yeah, you know something, I'll I, I tell you once, right, it was, it was Christmas 91, and I'm in full sun block, black and blue from the screws. There was a black lad from Sheffield, Keith Knowles, we, was, we had a load of E's, we had a load of E's, and we give everyone a knee on one condition, smash fuck out of yourself the sink, the toilet, the lot, and we did. We fucking demolished that block, you know what I mean? The strong box got demolished, and they come in the next day. 
oh, so all the muffed gate, all the riot screws were all mops, <laughs> not shields. I said, do you change your tactics? They came in and levered fuck out of me. You know what I mean? But that was a good sign, that, that was a good sign. Dave Armani, I just, he's just come with his name. Cotney Ladder will come across. He's just come, he was there, I think. Uh, yeah, we just wrecked, wrecked the block. But I was eight, I was in 20, 21, right? Got levered. I always remember being in a body belt, black and blue. The governor came in with all his posh fucking mates from the local housing estate with the posh wives. New Year's Eve. I didn't even know it was New Year's Eve. I remember going in that body belt before Christmas Day. That's all I remember. The next minute was New Year's Eve, the bells in York was ringing. I had a little cry to myself. I thought, all my family would be thinking, oh, I dad an ain't here, but at least he'd be all right. I'm tucked up like this, like a fucking chicken, black and blue. Uh, and I had people looking through my spy hole. And I always remember the governor said, yes, 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 or something. Is this how you look after paedophiles? And he went, yeah. And I was fucking fuming. Lay there, black and blue, full of my own shit and piss. Yeah, I remember that clearly that day. Yeah, and I've been there for fucking hell, been there for days and days and days. But you get through it because you, because it just becomes the norm. And I'm no big hard cunt, five foot nothing. Uh, I've met some right brutal hard motherfuckers in jail. And whether you did or me, you just learn to deal with it, I suppose, you know what I mean? Didn't want to be one of them people who hang, hanged himself, killed himself. I wanted to get out the other side, you know what I mean? I didn't want to give them the satisfaction because I knew some of them would. Some people out here would, <laughs> you know what I mean? But definitely some people out there in jail would have. So I didn't want to do that. And I had always that belief, something better will come around the corner. Every time I went for parole, I got knocked back, knocked back, knocked back. For the most bullshit, you know what I mean? So that becomes tiresome. Then you start losing hope and, and things like that. And you just, I don't know, human being, brain, powerful thing, I suppose. My brain just sort of never died completely sort of thing, you know what I mean? Uh, and like I say, I've always met people who were in a way more situation than me. And I, like I say, when I went back to Full Sun the last time, I met two lads who was uh, the outlaws who got Nick for the, uh, the Hells Angel killing on the motorway. About 15 years ago, Simon and Trotter, Trotter dead now. Rest his peace. And I tell you what, one of the nicest men you would have met in your life. Beautiful men. Simon's still here, thank God. And I write to Simon. Beautiful men. Landed on uh, Sea Ring. Was it Sea Ring? In the uh, full sun. And they come in my cell and said, them screws have just been talking about me. I said, why? I said, was you shagging a bird in here in the night? I said, why? They went, one's married to her. They're fucking fuming. I just laughed off and they made me a meal every day then. Salford kid, Ricky Smith, come round. He's a top lad. He brought me a, a ball of mate and ball of nails, mates round. But the, yeah, the outlaw brothers, they brought me a, a meal every day, looked right after me then, looked right after me. And uh, Trotter died, cancer. So, yeah, people are always worse than off than me, you know what I mean? I've had so many people on the show where they talk about being friends with serial killers, mass murderers, fucking mad bastards. Because when you're in there, you forget actually what crime they've done and see them for... I've hung around with people for two years and I haven't got a clue what they're in for. Mm -hmm. Just taking through the air. But yeah, I've sat there. Well, one was called Roy Hall. He had some from Scotland, the butler. Yeah, remember, do you know him? Mm -hmm. Roy Fante, they call him, mm -hmm. from Scotland, the butler. Oh, you have to research him. Yeah. Roy Hall, I think he's called. But he'd, he'd, that's, he'd dress up as Arabs. and But he was Lord of the Manor, as the manor in the port, or whatever you call him. Knocking them off. Killing them. Proper dangerous fucker. But you, to look at him, not a little old man. You know what I mean? So, yeah, you've come across the worst of the worst. You come across some barn pots. And a lot of them should be in mental hospitals. Well, not a lot of them, but a lot. Some, some should. And they are just a dumping ground. They are. Who's the maddest bastard you've you've been in with? 
No way would I say it's Charlie Bronson. No way. Lovely guy, Charlie. Done me a painting years ago. I dumped it near the bins. Fucking hell. I said someone must have robbed him, but I'll fucking kill him. <laughs> they want it. You know what I mean? Well, I took it on the visit to give me my mum and mum went, I ain't fucking going on with that. <laughs> you know, should have kept it. Probably worth a few grand now. Yeah. But he was funny, him. First day I met him. Like I say, met him the first time in 1990, in full sun. Sat on the end of my mate's bed. I didn't know who he was. I said, yeah, fucking budge up, mate. <laughs> you know what I mean? But me and him, it off, he'd come in my cell every morning, can cook breakfast, and, oh, fuck I'm not a morning person, you know what I mean? And, yeah, started sleeping on the bed, on the floor, like Callum. Because the first year in jail anyway, I had no bed anyway. Never on a bed, taking it off, giving you back at fucking eight o'clock at night, if you're good. Then you've got a readaptive sleeping on the floor all day. So I said, keep it, you know what I mean? So they did. <laughs> that was my second night in that. They took my bed off me. First night in, I had a bed. Next morning, he opened the door and said, take your bed out. I went, you what? Some scow screw car Peters. If you're alive, I hope you're fucking in pain. Horrible, man. He took my bed off me. And that night, I thought it was going to come round and give me back. <laughs> he didn't. I thought, I'm not asking for it. So I went, no bed for a long time. On and off, on and off sort of shit. Then I met Alan, Alan Lord. And me and Alan just ripped my bed frame out of my cell. And he smuggled a sleeping bag from the courts. High security prison, my ass. My boy fucking brought a sleeping bag back. <laughs> smuggled that in. And a camera. He was fucking taking photos of everything. All the security. We was fucking doing what we wanted. So I had a sleeping bag and I just went, fuck he's with the bed. And when I'm down the block, they'd say, take his bed off him. The screw will say, but he ain't got a bed. The governor presume him. I ain't got a bed frame, but I've got a mattress. And I didn't have no the fucking Deming jacket as a pillar or something, you know what I mean? But yeah, just a carrot. Be good, or we won't have you can't have your bed and all that lot. And I think the prison service ain't gonna swallow this shit any longer. Years ago you had no tellies, and now they've got a teller with shit channels. These are used to fucking everything on a button, on phone, anything they want. So that TV ain't a carrot anymore. It's fuck all. I take your telly off you. Can have it. Fucking ITV soon, fucking all that. Fucking reality shit and that fat Gemma Connors and people like that. Don't want what shit like that, you know what I mean? So that ain't an incentive anymore, that teller. The systems are just getting worse and worse. Rehabilitation is just another made up word, like he said on Shawshank Redemption. Now it's any rehabilitation whatsoever. As soon as you get out of prison, they give you 47 fucking quid. I was going to open that about 62 quid and say, there, off you go. Then you don't get no benefits or whatever for fucking six weeks or whatever. How the fuck someone's going to survive? I was lucky, I had a few decent people in my life. But what happens in people who haven't got nothing? They're resorting to crime straight away. Surely, all these contracts who these prison services get, they're earning fortunes. I know in Buckley Hall, I think they made something like 18 grand a week building pallets, putting pallets together. Who's getting the 18 grand? Not the fucking inmates. They're getting a tenner a week each. Give them 100 quid a week, got to work for it. Got to fucking, but they save 80 quid a week. Johnny gets out after four years with that much. Simon gets out after 10 years with that much. They're going to value that money. They're going to respect it. They're not going to go and swander it like they've just robbed it because they've worked their ass off for four years, five years. There's a deposit on a gaff, driving license and so on and so on. That's how you can change crime. Not letting someone out after fucking 10 years or 30 years with 46 quid in his hand. Then start giving him spare squalor. And he vaps on the system. Stay away from crime, drugs and violence. Oh my God, hypocrites. Every fucking house they've offered me, it comes with all three. One house of probation service give me. Fuck me, police have come round. Looked over my shoulder and went, wow, got your gaff looking smart. Who's got you this? I said, probation, he went, do you realise where you're living? I said, nah, crime and drug hotspot for the last 13 years. HMO6 
six flats turned into a house, a big old house turned into six flats. Crime ridden drug dens in the biggest way. So if the probation are fucking deeming that fit for you, where are we going wrong? How's Big Alan Law? Because I've had Alan on a show, like a big gentleman, obviously I know he'd done a murder when he was a young kid, but I can only judge people for what I see him now. And like I say, he was a big gentleman. Like, I know he was ruthless in prison though, because he'd done the strange way riots and that. Like, he was a big fucking unit. Like, how was he in prison? Most nicest guy you'd ever meet. Say that very easy. He wasn't an handful in jail, though. He was an handful if he fucked him over and the screws was coming on him. But I've never seen him have an argument with an inmate. Maybe a slight disagreement. But I've never seen any violence of it, of Alan, ever. And he'd done a 30 stretch? Yeah. No far off, 32, I think he did. Never seen Alan be violent. Seen him punch a door once and put a right fucking dent in it as well. And that was a steel door. Uh, never seen Alan be violent. Never seen him be threatening to a screw with anyone like that. Or an inmate. Alan is, put it his way, so wrong to keep that man in that length of time. You know what I mean? Like I say, he was like me, a kid, 18, 19 year old. All right, totally different types of crime. Mine was, you know, a violent crime from the word off, murder. His was, you know, a robber and it went wrong type of thing. But, so glad he's still the person he is. So glad of that. Because, yeah, he's a strong man. He's gone through a hell of a lot. I don't know half this stuff, what he's gone through. Probably only himself knows that. But for him to still get out and have that bounce in his step and a de desire, like I say he set his own gym up. I think he had an issue with that. I think he got a recall at some stage and he lost things like that. Another system kicking you in the balls, ripping everything what's decent out of your life. But yeah, on on the note, as Alan, beautiful man, beautiful. And I'm glad. I hope he gets everywhere he gets in life. I hope he's got a cracking woman in his life. I hope he's got all that. Yeah. Were you ever involved in any of the riots, prison riots? Been in a few, I've been in a few, but never been nicked for him and stuff like that. Like I say, was in one in a uh, full sun. What's that adrenaline like when you know one going to kick yeah, it's off? Great. Is that your kind of only piece of fucking where you feel as if you've got one in the system, you know you're going to get fucked for it, but does that give you a sense of freedom where you've took over the fucking prison hall or whatever it is you've done? Yeah. Like you say, you know what I mean? She is like a pack of wolves and would be a pack of wolves. And that was the best thing about being in them dispersals. In them days, everyone was staunch. Everyone stood by each other for with us and we're coming for your sort of attitude. It ain't like that anymore. Now it's run by all the Muslims and all that shit. Ain't good. You know what I mean? The the makeup of the prison service now is totally different. The dispersal systems to what they once was. Now, like I say, love terrorism and all that shit. And uh turning a terrorist. Should they segregate them all on one fucking wing? I think, so they can't. Because you see in this, I was down the block, I was this like piece of shit, slagging the Muslims off, left, right and centre. The moment we got put on the wing, a week, he was walking around with all the fucking gams on. Right? Shit house. All he did it for was, because he feels safe. Because they do back themselves up, they do look after themselves. That's what we've missed, that's what we've lost. Used to be like that. The staunchest people I've seen in prison was the Cotneys and the Scousers, by far. Yeah, I'd say that. Yeah, definitely by far. Scousers are mad bastards, aren't they? They've, they they kind of live a city within their own city, kind of hanging out there. I right, say so Manchester and... I like, like Glasgow, Manchester, Liverpool. Leeds, Birmingham, London, all tough bastards. I've come from, I've I've come, I've met top lads from all them cities, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I've met some top lads from like little farming villages who've... Big farmers don't give a fuck, man. Big, yeah. Six feet five, you know I mean? strong. And these people who think, oh, that farm is from Somerset, must be a bell and then he's smashing it, he's millions or whatever, you know, daft. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, fucking hell. Yeah. Scousers, I love, I, I love the Scousers, I always say this, like, I don't know, man. It's just something about them. They're just 
but in this day, in this day and age, like everybody's weak. Like the men are weak, becoming weaker. Like all those little snitches, they're all fucking feeling sorry for themselves. Like the scouses are just different breed. They're the just scouses they're something raised out. Differently. The st- scouses sort me out with me mate Nick and me mate Sunday, and. Uh, Oh, they put on right, good night on with me, you know what I mean? Took me to fancy restaurants, put putting fucking money on the bar. They soon we had a night and a half. Staunch people. And when I got my parole, when I got my parole, the morning was going home. I waited for about 40 minutes, because it was a scouser called Peter Clark. He's got an old of course, Steve, both blinding people. Top of the street, top genuine men. And uh, Peter was on the phone, and I waited and waited for him to get off his phone because I wanted to say to that to him, you know what I mean? Uh, That's a quality, and I would have respected that man, Peter. Uh, I remember when I did get room release, your life for officer coming dead happy. That news is good news. I said, just read the fucking answer. I just want the answer. Yeah or no? And she went, yeah. And she was dead happy. She went, aren't you like over the moon? And my only response was, 20 years over date, overdue. That was my only attitude. Told nobody on the wing until I told my mum. Yeah, for my mum. And that was long overdue for my mum, that, you know what I mean? Because she feels to blame. She never said that, and I'd never say that neither, and I'd never even think of it. But as a mum, she would have thought, if I had never met him, blah, blah, blah. So she probably felt bad. So that was the first person I told my mum. So she was made up. But like you say, four short months after getting out, my mum dies. So that was a killer blow, you know what I mean? And I, I wish my life would have been better getting out, as in more things put in place for me, rather than being off his shitholes, rather than my mum seeing me living in a shithole, rather than somewhere like Darren's on his feet now, blah, blah, blah. So she had a few concerns over me, probably. She wouldn't let on. My mum died unexpectedly the same day the royal King Charles's son got married uh, four years ago or something now, right? Uh, but that turned into a strange day the, mem- the day my mum died. Because uh, my mum's called Dan, sat in St. Anne's Square in town, Manchester. I'm upset, crying, sat there on a bench. Five women, total strangers to each other, have come over to me asking if it was all right. And the first girl who was there said to the others, he don't need you, he's got me. Got talking to her. I said, I've only spent three months, four months with my mum. And I told her why. And at that moment, I didn't care if she just walked off thinking, you know, we've killed someone, got off. She said to her, I did 15 years. I said, what? Good looking girl as well. Little Demi Moore, dressed smart as hell. And she said, yeah, she, uh, she had a fight with a bloke, got stabbed once, done 15 years, which I think was wrong anyway, because I know plenty of people stabbing someone eight times, 27 times and doing sixes, you know what I mean? Made an example with her. Uh, me and her got close. Only in, as I in my life a short space of time. She died in a car crash, rest her soul, you know what I mean? July 19th, 2019. Uh, and I got recalled the next day. Got a three month sentence. I'm in Manchester City, so no. And all I want to do is go and get a photograph of Zara, go and lay some flowers. That's all I want to do. And I've got a poxy little blade. And when I say a blade, that big, as with it fucking folded open. And uh, I've gone to walk in the shop to get a photograph, and I thought I'd get it after my breakfast, or I'll carry a photograph around. And uh, police have gone to drop, grab some kid, kid, he's dropped some spice and some weed or whatever on the floor. They've nicked me for it, because I got in the way. That got dismissed. Ended up getting three months for epoxy blade. The judge in court said, don't want to send you to prison, it serves more purpose, blah, blah, blah. Does more damage. Got three months thinking I was out in six weeks. Try fucking three months in jail. So you're always going backwards step. And that's just not because of that charge. That's because of a charge what I got done 30 odd fucking years ago when I was a child. And I'm always going to pay for that. And that's, that's the stinking blow. You know, I get done for something now. I don't just get done for that. 
they go, oh, recall him because he done some fucking 1980s. I, I don't think that life license should stand. I don't. I think you should have a period of, say, five years or something. Then no matter what you get nicked with from then on, you only go back to prison if it warrants a prison sentence. Not because you've got a probation officer picking the phone up saying recall him because she's seeing your pants up in a car with someone or someone who's up to no good doesn't mean I am or you're missing an appointment. I've been threatened with recall a few times, missing an appointment. It's not deemed necessary to recall you at this time, but what, because I missed an appointment? You got fucking paedophiles messing with kids going, to, don't even get probation for fuck's sake. You want me to go back to prison because I missed an appointment. How can I progress in my life? Having that hanging over your head. Feels like you, you're living your life on eggshells. And that's not the way forward. How many times did you get your appeal get rejected uh, for release? Or 12 times. Most of the time I couldn't go for pro because... I yeah, how many times did your pro get rejected? Uh, before you got out? About 10 times. About 10 times, yeah. And how is that every two years? Every two years, but here's the thing. This is why I end up doing so many years. So say, for instance, we're on the 1st of November now, and I get a two-year knockback. In, by right, my parole hearing should be 1st of November in two years' time. That's when the process starts. So it takes nine months then. So you've waited two years, then it takes another nine months for the reports to get written. Then a date's got to be set for the pro lady, and then someone won't be able to be available. So it'll get put back another three months, then another three months. I waited once, 22 months for an answer, a pro answer, which was a KB, a knockback, and the knockback started from the moment I got the knockback. Been waiting two years for the knockback. back. So really, it's four years. So see when you get 10 rejections for your parole, did you ever think you were getting out? Nah, there's many times when I thought, I'm not going to get out here. You know what I mean? Was there any cases similar to you who was maybe doing a 30 or a 40 stretch for something? Look, Charlie Bronson, for instance, 50 odd stretch he's done for example. a robbery. And I know he's caused fucking havoc in there and he's took people hostage and he's, he has been a fucking nuisance, but I believe the man should be let go now. Give the guy a chance. Like, he could be out he's for not a, killed no one. He could be out for a day and then straight back in. Like, he could How be disproportionate a, the yeah. system is that you can let an IRA terrorist out who's just gone and killed five people and probably killed many more, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, on the other hand, keep someone in who's never killed anyone. 40 years? Yeah, someone out after 13 years for killing, who tried to kill our Prime Minister, for fuck's sake. Where's the justice in that? It's so one-sided. And the and, and the government say we don't deal with terrorists. <laughs> Lying fuckers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Seeing you're in though, did you ever think, fuck it? Did you ever think, what's the point in doing... A few times, yeah. ...shit in there or they'll take your own life or whatever? Obviously, when your mum's still alive, you prob she's probably kept you alive at points. But yeah. Was that at a time in your mind where you thought, what's the point anymore? Yeah, a few times where, like say, you're in pure despair, because, listen, who the fuck, how hard you are? You've been down them, them segregation units with absolutely nothing. It's designed to destroy your soul. I've seen people who've never recovered from it. I've seen some people who are really staunch and hard, and they're like an empty cell in the red anymore, the, sh the shell just empty anymore so it has done some brutal damage to them and it does and it doesn't happen just to the weak you know what i mean like you say mention someone there who was a staunch as proper quality man he took his own life so if it can happen to someone like him it can happen to him so yeah there's been moments where it's been pure fucking despair but i just don't know what they've been in me to keep me ticking i don't know and I've had a few people say to me, who were proper hard lads, say, but I couldn't have done what you've done. It got to that stage where it just became the norm. And if I can't explain to you how it feels to done 30 years, I can't explain it. <laughs> it goes right over me fucking head. <laughs> so, you know something, right? Yeah. The other month, I was in this fucking apartment and I thought, should I go out, should I go out, should I go out on a thought? Fuck it, going out, yeah? As soon as I got out, pissing down. 
and smokes a bit of weed, yeah, big deal, don't take any class at his back. So, smoking a bit of weed, and I was thinking, why the fuck have I come out? And I looked in the shadow of the window and I thought, yes, I'm free. <laughs> and I had a right good night, went out on the sea centre on my own, load of fucking stupid mad bars, transvestites there, every fucking walking life. I had a right good night. I had a drinking session with these fucking five lesbian girls from Salford. I had a right good night. And I thought, yeah, I'm free. And it was a good feeling. It was the only time I've ever felt like that. Any time I've, when I got out, I didn't, it, I just took it like a pinch of salt. I didn't stand there going, wow, this is bright, fantastic. And even when I had my very first escorted day out, I only had one or two of them. Didn't have home leaves and stuff like that, me, like anyone else, never got that. I had a day out once with my life officer, Claire, and we've been, I was with her for an hour, and she said, you know something, you've never been to Derby Town Centre. You're giving people fucking directions. I said, I don't know. She said, it seems like you've been in 20 months, not 20 odd years. She said, you're not rehabilitated, you're not institutionalised, you don't, you don't need all that muddy coddling. Bit here, day here, day. I don't want all that, didn't want all that. Don't want to go home for the weekend and keep looking at me watch and going back. My attitude was, you fucking dump me in the deep end. Throw me in, throw me out at the deep end. You kick me in, kick me in, throw me out. Don't want that day here, getting a taste of it and a day there. That's just, that's just slowing my life down, that. Going back to jail and having a taste of it. Don't want all that, and I didn't. So I'm glad I didn't get that. And they were saying, oh, we can't leave release until you've had home leaves and this and that. Don't need it. And she said for me on a pro report, you don't need all that shit. And I didn't. Just wanted to be get out and find out myself. Because the system, like, we don't know how you're going to respond to this and we don't respond, we don't know how you can respond to that. Well, how do you know until they do it? And here's another thing, what you suppose on my, you used to say to me on pro hearings, we're finding it too hard now to release you because you've been in too long. So we're going to review you in two years time. So I used to say, but then it would have been in even longer. What was it like when you got your parole? Do you remember the feeling after 30 years? Yeah, like I say, my life officer. I went in the parole hearing, right? Every parole hearing, I've had to struggle and battle and prove and prove in a powerful way that you are lying. I've had the best legal teams and best psychiatrists on my parole hearings and stuff, arguing with some two Bob trainee straight out of college arguing with someone who's been in the job 30 years so i've just got the right people at the right time to attack them and prove them wrong but i've still not got nothing on my last parole hearing as soon as i sat down i got told i was i got parole and i started saying oh hold on you might even need my case and my solicitor was saying fucking hell you've got it i said hold on but i don't see anything change from that 18 month ago so if it was deemed not bad dangerous enough to be released 18 months ago. The only thing I've done different is move prison. It makes no sense to me. I've not done no, nothing different. And I sat and took my coat off. As soon as I walked in there, they went, uh, asked me some question like, where, where are you going to live when you get out? I went, what do you mean? He went, you've, you've got your release. Well, fucking hell. I mean, sat down. Were you emotional? No, it wasn't. I wasn't, I wasn't numb, I wasn't apprehensive, I wasn't thinking, oh, fucking scared, I wasn't anything like that. I just thought, done all my living in my head, all my life. How hard is that, like, doing a fairy stretch, but other people have got your life in a piece of paper where they can either sign it, sign it off to get out or they can keep you in just like a caged monkey, like, how hard it's, is that knowing that people have terrible. that? And just, Dave, Veering off that a little bit, how many people have been in the system and been nutted off? And things like that, where a piece of paper's been signed and they've been sent to these hospitals and just been forgotten of, feeded like Axel and people like that. And that's gone on. I know people who never went for psych psychology reports in case they got nutted off. Mm -hmm. Just left it. Yeah. Just fucking you know, left it to try and get a cat B, cat that's C. That's how you speak. Just stayed in double cat A. You can get yeah. a triple cat A, can't you? Yeah. In Parkhurst, you used to be, what was he called? Creepers or something. The fucking doctor there who ran the hospital. I believe he used to fucking run around the forest naked. That was the rumour with a mask on. 
And he was knocking people off left, right and fucking centre him. So I'd never been in fear of that. And, but I used to always fear of having nobody, having no family. You've got no communication out there with no one. Because then they can do what the fuck you want. Who've you, who, who you got to tell? Who, who's listening to you? No one. So I always had like my sister and someone like that. So that was good. I always had a lifeline out there. But there's so many people who have just get faded, faded away. And you never see them again. See, when you got out for the first day, what was it like being with your mum? Like, that, that must have hit you like a ton of bricks. My so. younger sister picked me up at Sally. And like I say, it was her biological dad who were murdered. How did, what did she say about it? She came on my parole hearing once, our Sally, and she said to the parole board, I think it's disgraceful how long my brother's been in. My dad was a nasty man, blah, blah, blah. And you're just ripping our family apart, keeping my brother in any longer. I mean, they had the right attitude against that, the parole board. And my, she told me, my Sally, our, he had another daughter. And the probation service got in touch with our Sally saying, this other daughter wants to get in touch with her. So they agreed. And when our Sally met her, she said, I was your Darren, as he got kids married and all that lot. And our Sally said, he's still in prison. She went, what? Still in prison for that? And that was his own daughter. So yeah, I am bitter that I've missed out on wife, kids, all that type of stuff. Because I always get told that make a good father, I'd be a piss poor father because they just sign me front round the finger. You know what I mean? Can't say no to him. But yeah, that hurts in a sense. If I, if I think about it, that does hurt. But uh, I'm in a lucky place in the sense that you probably agree with this. I've seen a lot of people who've done a long time in prison, even five years in prison, <laughs> 10 years in prison, 30 years in prison or whatever. And some of them have got out and they've made it, as in states, ed, in gear and stuff like that. And some of them have just turned to drugs, defeated, life of just nothing, you know what I mean? I've, I've been to business schools and Google Garage doing business skills and stuff like that. I want to go down that business line, me. You know what I mean? I've missed out on having a business career or any career, spending 30 years of my life, you know what I mean? Uh, so, yeah, I'm lucky in the sense that I could have been a person who never comes out, never, you know, just hibernates and just can't and got a conversation in any any anything like that the other day i sat there with fucking four irish girls having a fucking bottle of wine <laughs> didn't even know them <laughs> it was in the altar he invited me over so yeah and i told them about what we was doing and they didn't bat an eyelid of what i told them and i'm not fucking uh ashamed of what i've been in prison for neither i'm not i will tell someone I'd be the first person, yeah. I've been in prison for this and I'm not ashamed. I've not gone and killed someone just for the sake of killing them uh, or killing them because they support fucking a different, you know, different religion or a different football team or because he's got a prison uniform on or a cop uniform. Nothing of the sort, man, you know what I mean? So I'm lucky that I've still got my head about me and I've still got desires and dreams and yeah dreams that say the word is don't know what the future holds in that sense see I really you, don't see when you get a fair to Dan and then you come out what's the biggest changes you've seen to society uh, how fast things are I'd say but I jumped in a car straight away and drove it and that didn't put me off at all. Wait, you eat. I used to get fucking sick of people. Remember once I was in a jail and a lad's been in six week. Six week. And he's had a day out. And he came back going, oh, everything's so fast and all. Oh, fucking, I'll get a grip. Six week. I I didn't stand on the pavement going, wow, and all that lot. I just got in the stride of it. And loads of people, and on art, said, looking at your dad and just no one would ever guess you'd just done 30 years. 
so switched on and you're modding, you dress well and up to date and stuff like that. So yeah, I wasn't apprehensive crossing the road and dealing with money or anything like that. Nah, it's nothing like that, you know what I mean? One apprehensive, getting out, one fearful of anything. Yeah, you're not a fucking crippled, you know what I mean? But there's some people who do big sentences and end up doing more shit in there because they're fearful of coming out. I've seen it, I've seen it, yeah. I can't understand that, I can't understand that. I'd rather have a life out here than a life in there. You know what I mean? Horrible world in there, it is. You dress it up. We've just had a beautiful breakfast this morning. Beautiful, right? That's just a fucking dream in prison. It is. Like say me walking down that road one night, piss wet through, and just looks in the window and I thought, I'm free. Go where the fuck I want. You lose track on that. You do. You really do lose track on that. And that's an horrible thing to, to lose. But like I say, there's so many people who are not going to ever get them chances. But this is my life, not theirs, sort of thing. You know what I mean? If I had my way, I'd fucking have them all on. But I don't. So... I've got some good friends in prison still, and I wish I could see them get home, you know what I mean? Some of them might, some of them might not. It hurts me that, in a sense. And I tell you what, when I got, when I was moving from Full Sutton, and I had a bit of a tear in my eye, leaving me two mates, Simon and Tra, I did. And they said to me the nicest thing, because they're doing 35 wrecks, right? 10 into it, 8 into it. And like I say, tried to died, rest his soul. And I was like gutted that I was leaving him, knowing I'm not going to be able to speak to him ever again. And he said, hey, listen, no, as you was rotting in them blocks and fucking going for you pure shit, we was outside having the right good fucking time. Sure turn now. And that meant a lot to me that, you know what I mean? It did, because there's two men who, might never come might never come home and they was wishing me that from the bottom of their eyes, you know what I mean? So leaving people behind like that, soft as it sounds, hurts in a sense. Because I've got that chance, you know what I mean? So getting out I wasn't apprehensive of anything. I wasn't scared of anything. And I didn't even see it as a big adventure. I was just looking forward to getting Getting on with getting on with it, uh, a better life. Like I say more educated. I'm a man now, not an 18 year old wild young kid off an housing estate because that's what I was. You know what I mean? But no serious offending, selling drugs to your kids and burgling your house and shit like that. Never done anything like that. You know what I mean? So I'm 53 years old now. Don't feel it. Still fit, lad. Train every day. I haven't trained for a while. I've been boxing and all that shit. Oh, all the white colour boxing and all that lot. But yeah, training has, has been the key for me. That's the best drug in prison. Because, you know, I say, you need something to get through them lonely, fucking horrible years. And I've seen this. People who've not took drugs in prison, they've got out so damaged. They have. So... Yeah, I'm 53. I don't feel like I'm 53. Especially when I'm training, it does keep me head in gear, you know what I mean? I've got a big super bike. <laughs> Looking forward to getting that out next week. Yeah, I don't know what the future holds. I've not sort of tried to work that one out. But yeah, I want good things in my life. Fucking right, I do want something to show for my life. Like I say, all my sisters have got children. They've got something to show for them, their lives. You know, I don't have that. So, I don't use that as, I don't think of that even, you know what I mean? It own, it, it's home sometimes when I'm with people and, and they see me with kids and the kids, their kids or strangers' kids come in the room and they owe me mum, because I'm a big kid or something, you know what I mean? They owe me mum, and we have a right good fucking laugh. I've got my little niece, a little motocross bike, and I've never been happy over it, like, but she be all right. But, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. Like say, I've never thought about going down that book, doing a book. I don't even see myself as I've got a story in me for fuck's sake because I don't think 
anything's particularly as special about my life, my story. It's just another fucked up story from the, the British justice system. But one of many. Because you've lived it, that will not feel as extreme, but you've done 30 fucking years for killing your mum's abuser. Like, I don't condone violence, but I condone that, sticking up for your mother. I would die for my kids, my family. I would kill for them. No fucking, no blink an eye. No fucking problem. But this is a society we're in. Like, there's too much people getting away with shit that should be getting big sentences, pedophiles, yeah. sex cases, people that's harming kids getting out yeah. on fucking community service, harming more kids and then getting 12 months. Do you know what I mean? Like they should be getting the big sentences. Yeah. Obviously you've done a lot of shit in there, but it doesn't warrant no. doing a fairy stretch. And how, but how do what's the worst thing about being in prison, Dan? Straight away having your freedom, so your choice. But you know, being a fucking adult and looking back, the shit what you've got to put your fucking family through. You know. I must have put my mum and dad through shit brothers and sisters and shit but not only just the, the shit and the loss but spending all them years apart I've not seen my sisters have a life they've not seen their little brother have a life so just having them things took away from you and all the, all the possibilities what I could have had in life I haven't got a clue what my life would have been like if I never went to prison I haven't got a clue I might have kids big house Big divorce, even by now. I don't know. Dead. Yeah, and I could have. Yeah, so I try not look too much into that sort of thing because it puzzles me sometimes. You know what I mean? Yeah, it would fry your brain. But like, say imagine. when anyone asks me about how you got through it and that, I don't have an answer. Or maybe I do have an answer, but I just can't explain it. I don't know. It's mad. Like I've, I've got friends from Salford, Manchester. They're mad bastards as well. They're yeah. wired up wrong. They're they're kind yeah. of fucking mad, they're mad bastards, solid, staunch, go to war with them, they would be there in a the heartbeat. Yeah. If I needed them, they'd be there in a the heartbeat. Not that I do, but I know how fucking tough they are, like the Scousers, like the Londoners and fucking yeah. the Glaswegians, like there's something in the water where you go, the, in fact, the whole of the UK is mad bastards from the top to the bottom. Like it's, a, it's a tough fucking nation, like it's, it's tough bastards here. We have a tough fucker from... Up here, Rab Carruthers. Yeah, big Rab, yeah. yeah. Passed away as well. Yeah, another another one, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, he was tough, man, the Carruthers. Yeah. He you was know. friends with Paul Ferris. Yeah. Another gentleman, you know what I mean? Another guy who's had nothing but shit in his life. But look how he's fucking flourished. Got nothing but adm admiration and respect for that man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Don't know the guy. What a top guy he is. You know what I mean? No people who've met him and know him and that. But yeah, like I say, I've had a very strange journey. Met the most strangest people in the strangest circumstances. And my sister said to me the other month, you know, our jeweler, said to me, if any regrets, and I can answer that straight a fucking way. I can do it straight away. I said, no. I've got regrets of missing time with my mum and dad. Use my sisters, my brothers, you know, my nieces and nephews and all that lot. Missing kids and stuff like that. But apart from anything else, no, I don't. Because one, I could have only met these people on the journey what I was on. And some of the people I've met in, in prison, I've not met people as good out here. I've had people in prison do me more good in a week than I've had people all my life do out here. You know what I mean? Uh, really good, true bond friendships, you know what I mean? Where I know for a fact they will never fuck me over in any way. And that we're two strangers just come together at circumstances. So I've met some beautiful people in that sense, you know what I mean? So I would have never met them people and I would have never swapped that for nothing. Uh, it's mad the cards people get dealt in life as well. Yeah. But Listen, I've had people on here fucking abused at six years old, amazing women, Della Wright, Sarah San, she killed her son's abuser, like, just mad stories. It's mad to think the, the cars that people get dealt in life, like, would you change that night you killed your mum's abuser? Yeah. yeah, of course I would, yeah. Or would you kind of just, because he could have eventually killed your mum. Yeah. 
But do you go over that night and think, fuck me, in 30 years of my life for I that? never do. Maybe I'm wired up a little bit different, I don't know. Would you change that night, though? If of course I would, yeah. Anyone who said, no, I'd do the same, knowing the consequences of what you are going to go through, but not what you might go through. Anyone would have to be a fool to choose it, because... I don't know, I've 30 years out here than 30 years in there. Because I've done more life, I've done more living as an adult in prison than ever outside. You know what I mean? That's pretty weird to get my head round. But like I say, I could be a lot worse off. I could be a raving drug addict. Absolute fucked. Mental health issues. Because a lot of people have got mental health issues. In, you know, years ago, people had mental health issues. In, Got to shut up, you mad cunt, you know what I mean? But like like we said before, I have seen some really strong soldiers, staunch people who've... Something's happened in the brain. The less fortunate than me, I'm here to, you know, start living one step at a time sort of thing, you know what I mean? So I'm fortunate in that sense, and I'm so fortunate that my sisters and that see me all right as well, you know what I mean? Don't sit, I've not got a close family anymore. Uh, always happens when your parents break down. You, you know, my dad died 20 years ago. You know, unexpected. Like my mum died. So our family has sort of drifted apart a little bit. And it probably would have drifted apart more and quicker if my mum wasn't there. So, so glad my mum did get to see a boy come home. Because that's what she wanted more than anything, you know what I mean? Do you, think so, she, do you think she stayed alive for you again? I home? reckon so, yeah. I do. And it was very strange how my mum died. Just killed over the next day when she was putting bunning up for them royals. But the day before, she was adamant, adamant to see her new granddaughter and took me other granddaughter, other, other granddaughter out for tea. So that was like, she was adamant to go and do that, my mum, for some reason. And she just killed over and my sister found her. Uh, my mum's cup of tea was still up. So it's just happened, you know what I mean? So I'm glad that I got out because I don't know how I would have felt. That wouldn't have been a nice thing. I would have fucked off. Would have fucked off or something, you know what I mean? Wouldn't have been having it getting knocked back for more years and shit. So I'm glad I got out and my mum got to see that, see me get out, you know what I mean? Did you get out of your dad's funeral? Yeah, I did, and I sold him straight and fucking going. You because know I, mean? I know I've had no Razor Smith on, man, and I was trying to fuck him about from going to his son's funeral. Yeah, it's, yeah, I've seen that, and it's fucking diabolical. Like, that is just wrong, that. It's fucking wrong, you know. They want you to re be rehabilitated. You're going to just be left with nothing but bitterness when you've been treated like that. You're not asking to go to your grandparents, you're asking to your sons. Now, I went to my dad's, and there was no problems whatsoever. No problem, no problems whatsoever. So, yeah, and like I say, it was a mark of respect for me, Dad. You know what I mean? I got up and done a speech, and I said to the, the screws, "These cuffs are coming off. I'm getting up and done this, doing a speech." And I did. I'm so glad I did. You know what I mean? Uh, did you ever think about fucking off when they took the handcuffs off? Well, I did fuck off in 2003. I had six months off. Got an escorted visit home. Blagged them because he was moving me everywhere and I blagged him. And uh, yeah, cut the cuffs off and left him sat there like daft cunts, shouting up the street, South, what a you bastard. And I took off and left him empty handed. And one of the screws went grey the next day. Tough. How long are you on the run for? Six months. <laughs> and you wonder how you done a ferry? <laughs> and I, and I, I, yeah, listen, I just got on with my life. Uh -huh. What was it like, escaping for six months? It was great. What but happened that day? Talk me through the whole day. Went to my mum's to see her because my mum was poorly. And uh, Screws was pain in the asses with me. Going, taking you to the police station if you want to use the toilet and all that lot. Fucking not. I'm in my mum's house now. Mum calls the shots, you know what I mean? So, went to the bathroom, coughed up mysteriously come off <laughs> you know what I mean so we must have just left some of it they mysteriously come off and I came back downstairs with him still on attached and when he went right it's time to go I said that right I just went got off fucking bounced him out of the way and got off 
have them stood there, running around, fucking looking for the phone to use to phone the police, asking people if you've seen a lad run past. <laughs> with handcuffs, one lad went, one lad went in Darren Southwood, didn't he? He went, yeah, he went, no, we're not seeing him. <laughs> yeah, so I did that because like I say, spent, I'd done 15 years over tariffs by then. You know what I mean? So enough is enough. You know, how many times are you going to keep knocking me back and open, open, open? Listen, some countries you've got the right to escape. Good on them. Where's that what going to live there? You know what I mean? Yous have got better laws than us. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think it is barbaric that you can go back to prison for some misdemeanor shit. And where, where, where is the... In, yeah, imagine it, right? You've got a wife, kids, mortgage. You're on a life license. You get recalled for some shit. Pay, paying this, what? Job logs are on the corner, what even get a fine for, but you're going back to prison. Your job's gone. Your mortgage, who's paying that? She's out on her ear, you're kidding the wife. You've gone back to prison for some of what don't really warrant a prison sentence. How can you start making ends meet and make, having a life when everything's you know, like, yeah, living on eggshells? Everything can be taken away like that. You can do something wrong without even knowing you've done something wrong. You know, associate with something. Recall your ask, ask questions, but there's got to be a better way to punish you. Seeing you were on the trot, where did you go? I had a nice little flat. I was just going out to work. Yeah, I was living totally normal. Can go with GTI, living normal. Just cracking on with it. Got pulled by the police. Give him a right load of fanny. I couldn't run. I had a big fucking dog with him. And I just stood there and gave him some load of bullshit details. He was asking me, like, have you ever had your dabs taken before? I was like, what are them? <laughs> Fingerprints. All right. <laughs> nah. Anyway, producer, off you go. My mates were shitting it more than me. I just, I just got on with my life. I, I don't way I wanted to get on with my life. I didn't think like, I'm looking over my shoulder. Just getting on with it. So and you, you were actually living an honest living. You weren't out thinking, fuck it, no. I'm going to do a couple of robberies. No. Fuck off. Just lived a totally normal life. And I believe. Did you change your appearance or anything? Uh, the photographs, what they had, what my mum give them. Oh my God. Look like something off Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> he was looking for Donald Duck or something. <laughs> not fucking me. They look nothing like me. My mum went, yeah, that, that's like, that's like. <laughs> I've been looking for Charlie Bronson. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. I just got on with my life. And I believe that there was a mention in the paper. I think a journalist had done it for me. There was a mention, like, you know, wanted, blah, 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 in the paper. Dangerous. And someone pointed out to him, a journalist from The Guardian, and they changed it and said, uh, apologise, he ain't dangerous, he wasn't a dangerous person, sort of thing. And even the police said to me when I was on my toes, we could have had you a few times, you know, but we knew you weren't up to the fuck on. Just getting on with it. Went a million miles away and shit like that. So I wasn't no threat in that sense. And like I say... Same situation with Alan Lord and people like that. You've done no bad, 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 but they just keep treating you like... Piece of shit. Shit, shit, shit. You're getting nothing. You're getting nothing. No matter what hard you proceed through the system. It's something... I remember once, once I went on a pro hearing, right? And it was going on over me threatening to throw boiling water over a screw, right? I said it in a flippant remark 15 years earlier. My legal team went, got no notice of this. When was it? I think it was last six months. 1994. My legal team went, fucking hell, it's 15 years ago. I know, going on about it, because he had nothing else to go on. So he was making a big mountain over that. How dare you threaten a prison officer? No, I didn't threaten, didn't have it in my hand doing that. I just said, listen, fuck off. No wonder someone fucking tried to throw a bottle of water over you last week. You get it again. Something like that, flippant remark. 15 years later, going mad on me pro hearing, and that was the pro hearing. And I, my sister came on and said, you know, it was my dad who died. My brother shouldn't be fucking spending this long in prison. And that's his own daughter, for sake, you know what I mean? And I've never had anybody, I've never had anybody say, you're a bad cunt for what you've done. Never had it. And I've, I've talked to soul strangers, like I say, I was in a really fancy art gallery. 
doing business with them, buying some, and they all know my background and stuff like that. And I told him, I've never had that fucking old piece of shit. Never been treated like that, you know what I mean? So I've just always had the intention of just getting on with my life and being a decent person, you know what I mean? And I have got some good values and good ethics, you know? Now, it's nice to be nice, isn't it? And like you say, yeah. being in them situations in prison where everything's just volatile in a confrontation, I say the one nicest thing I recognise of being a free man is life can be nice if you treat people right, you know what I mean? See, when you were on your toes and you get caught, were you thinking, that's me fucked? Yeah. I'm never getting out? Yeah. Really did. Why did you not fuck off? Funds, probably. Love your mother as well? Yeah. Did you not want to leave her? That wouldn't have been the case. My mum would have said, go and fucking enjoy your life. Yeah. My sisters would have had that attitude. They would have. Only because they're thinking, oh, when's my fucking brother coming home? You know, they're seeing contract killers and terrorists coming home after 10 years, 11 years. Their bro poor brother's still in after 20 years. They just wanted to see me have a, some kind of life, you know what I mean? And like I say, I'm not this person who's been in prison. This is my first time in prison. My first time, you know what I mean? So I wasn't a bad cunt where I'm just vicious, vicious, vicious. Wasn't the case. So my sisters would have had... Um, my sister would have been made up if I was abroad on my toes, living the life, living, would have. Obviously, I didn't get to that, that, and obviously I got out legally instead, which is a good thing, but I don't think I should have had to go through fucking 29, 30 years, and I don't think it can be justified, and I would love some top legal people and stuff like that, because when, when I was speaking to a, a, a QC barrister called uh, Alex Son, female, speaking to her and I showed her that transcript where the judge said there was no premeditation to kill or, or cause grievous bodily harm, she straight away said she, she looked shocked at her profession and she said, Dad, that's not a murder case. So I would love someone who's willing to have a battle with the system take my legal case on and get some justice and some answers. But the one nicest thing I would like out of life right at this moment, I've lost my mum, I've lost my dad, I've lost lots of other people. And said to me, probation officer one day, I don't expect you to turn around and say to me, it's totally justified what the system has done. You've not done it to me, but the system. And I said, I'd just love it for you to say to me, wasn't just, it was unfair, and she did. And that meant a lot to me, that. And I've been going, well, darling, I don't really know the circumstances of this and that, that, that. Don't worry, hear that bullshit. I just want to hear you as a human being. You know what I mean? Fuck your prison uniform or your probation badge or whatever. I just want to hear you. Do you think I justify doing that when you've got people doing this, 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 this? And she said, no, it isn't, darling. And that was good enough for me in that sense. So I've lost a lot, still got a lot to give, but it's like a home, <laughs> somewhere you could call home and start having a life and things like that, you know. Set my business up, I'd like to meet an investor, put a bit of time into me, muddy coddle me and mould me into something better and things like that, because I'm like a, a, raw, a raw diamond maybe, you know what I mean? Got a lot of ideas and love, get up and go, just need, that push sometimes like we all need, you know what I mean? You'd be surprised who watches these things, Dan. Like if anybody maybe want to get involved and maybe want to help you and give you that extra little lift in life to give you a chance, yeah. it's all down to you whether you take that chance or you fuck it and go, do you know what? Nah, he's, he's not worth Listen, it. But anybody, there's so many genuine people watch these podcasts and go, do you know what? He sounds like a good guy. I'm going to give him a fucking chance. Like how can people get in contact with you? In case they want to offer you a job or listen, but give you that plug you to they got in touch with you. And yeah, of course they can. They can drop me a message, Instagram, Facebook, yeah. email, and um, I can pass the message on. First of all, make sure they're legit. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of chances out there as well. But there is genuine yeah. people out there go, you know what? There's a fucking job that. Yeah. That people. I'd love. I'd love that because that's all we all need in life: a peg up. And no matter if you made out a fucking bulletproof or not, you still need a peg up in life. And like you say. I don't, it doesn't dawn on me sometimes of how long I've been away. 
Because sometimes I still feel like I'm 21, fit. You know what I mean? I'm not. So a lot of years in life has passed me by. I remember once I phoned the probation and I was pissed off. She was nitpicking over some bullshit. And I was just looking at all the business people in the offices, living life, going to work careers. I had a bit of a tear in my eye and I said, you know something, I missed out on all that. You know what I mean? And it doesn't hurt, but I know I've got a lot more to fucking offer than what I've given already. Really do believe that. And I think that's the be all and end of it, of me, me motivation of getting out and digging deep. Cause like I say, many times I've sat there thinking I'm never fucking getting out here, never. Just accept it sort of thing, you know what I mean? Where I've seen other people who are not getting out of, so they, they've just accepted it, you know what I mean? But I knew I had a lot more to give. I knew we had a slight chance of getting out. Remember once I bumped into Delroy Showers, who's a bit of a chap from Liverpool. And uh, I used to say to him, I'll be getting out, mate. Don't you fucking worry, Delroy. And he'd go, Bruh. and when I bumped into him, when I was out, he went, you know, nephew. He always calls me nephew. I said, what? He went, I didn't think you'd get out, you know. I said, listen, keep the faith, mate. I knew it would. I just had to box clever. And I realised the pen was mightier than the sword because I started educating myself and doing things like that, going through the right ways, going through the courts and stuff like that. That's where I was. I was being a pain in the ass. I had everyone in court in, on my wing taking them to county court for this and the other. But uh, I started do, doing that. I remember once my mate said to me, it was five, five to five on a Christmas evening, tea time, banged up. I banged up. I done my legal shit here and I wrote, screws coming to my door every 15, 20 minutes, checking on me. Next morning, he opened me up at half nine, half eight or something, Christmas day or Christmas boxing day. And the screw said to the outlaw brothers, he's not moved all night. Him. So they are just doing all my legal work, just transfixed into it, you know what I mean? And that's what kept me alive, I think. Because I didn't used to do that side, I'd be that or that, going down that road. Still a pain in the ass, but it was more productive in the long run. And I think that sort of sort of kept me alive in a sense that giving me hope where I was doing something. But yeah, I would love to see some justice out of it, of course I would. Oh God, yeah. I've never even had an apology <laughs> saying, listen, it was a bit uh, in excessive, you know what I mean? That'd, that'd go down nice. But I don't think anyone hand on art can turn around and say, yeah, it's justified what we've done to this man. Especially when you're letting contract killers out after doing 15 years, 20 years, you've killed two people. And you've got to also bear in mind, I've not committed no acts of violence ever since my index offence. You know what I mean? Even though I've lived in a crazy, crazy unruly fucking madhouse, you know what I mean? Where people are getting stabbed, fucking killed for a piece of toast, seen it, seen it. Nothing but violence. What's the worst thing you've seen in prison, Dan? Uh, yeah, I've seen someone stabbed to death. Yeah, seen that. A few times, things like that. Uh, cooking fat thrown over someone. Deserved it as well. It's that one of the corny lads, so he was getting it anyway. He was an horrible cunt. But yeah, melted his fucking head, mate. Melted his head. That's not sugar and water. This is something else. This is cooking fat. What's been on the cooker for fucking four hours? Like napalm. I've seen nothing but that. I've seen naughtiness like that. And yeah, how the other half live, eh? And I hate unnecessary violence. Absolutely fucking hate it. I hate seeing people having confrontations over bullshit. Just leads to naughtiness, doesn't it? Like I say, my area's seen a lot of naughtiness where I came from. Like I say, notorious case 12 years ago, you know. Dale Cregan and that's the area where I come from. I know all them. No winners at the end of the day of it, is there? It's just ruined lots and lots of lives. Lots of poor lads never coming home, ever. And some of them who, who have got 33 wrecks, the 33 when they got it, I had one of them say, fucking hell, Dad, and if I'm as fit as healthy as you, after I've done 25, I'll be happy. 
I said, you're forgetting. I got mine as a kid. 18, 19, not 33. Big difference. So, lots of people who are fucking so far more misfortunate than me. And like I say, at the end of it, there's no winners at the end of it. I just want a better life. I want me people who will, who will love to have a better life. Uh, and see some out of my life. I mean, like I say, I've never thought about writing a book. I've had people say to me, probation officers and people like that, loads of times, you've got a book in you. I can, can yap like fuck sometimes. <laughs> for what, you, know what I mean? for this thing. you know what I mean? I can. Yeah. I don't know what it is. But I've, I've never... I've looked at these people who write books and I've just thought, I can't understand these people who write books and start admitting shit from years back. I can't understand that. Got away with it, sweet, just keep it shit. Yeah, like, yeah, I killed fucking Johnny Nine Fingers six years ago, and blah, blah, blah. I don't want to know all that. So I've never thought about a book in that sense, but I have, I have had a lot of people say to me, you know, something, I've got a book in you. And looking at that, I probably would like to be, if I had that, that chance, I probably would like to go down that road. Like I say, it's all totally new to me, this. And maybe be a good book where it was. Not like necessarily a self-help book. Fuck it, I don't know if they work. But uh, I'd like to see something positive rather than just being a crime book. Yeah, definitely. You know and this I mean? is the thing about these podcasts that like people get to tell their story and what happens is it gives them a new lease of life. It gives them the confidence. Wait a minute, people like my story. People are sending me messages saying, unbelievable, fair play to you for coming through it. Like, you're still here to tell the tale. You've done a fair to stretch. I was never apprehensive of meeting you. And we've said that this morning. Like I say, I didn't read anything up and we've spoken on the phone and, you know, I knew, I, I, I clicked with you straight away and knew you was a top guy, you know what I mean? Never mind speaking to everyone in your city last night. <laughs> Offering me lines of coke and everything. Bro, <laughs> <laughs> Give me your phone number, he said. I said, what for you? I'm going to have some coke. James is good stuff, I said, nah, mate. I'll be on farm in the morning. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> okay, hell, a bit about some girl called Lindsay. She spotted I mean, Lindsay. She was good stuff. But yeah, I, I I wasn't apprehensive for doing this. Uh, brand new to doing anything like this. It's different being where you're being recorded and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, like I've been told this morning, just be yourself in it. And I'm not the fucking. I'm not a perfect person. I've got a few flaws in my life, obviously, and we all. But yeah, I'd like something good to come out of my life and something positive. And I'm so glad I'm fucking out. I'm so glad I've got a chance to have a life. And oh, I know no one's going to listen to me in, that sense, in this sense. All these people who are doing whatever. Hope they don't have to go through your shit. I've had to go through it. You know what I mean? I don't. I don't wish on anyone, you know what I mean? Because you don't realise this when you're 17, 18. You just think it's you, 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 who's paying for it. My mum and dad must have gone through a lot, you know what I mean? Never mind my sisters and things like that. Uh, so there's no, there's, there's been no winners in, out of this. And like I say, I could easily be bitter, could easily be like that. But then there's, no, there's going to be no winners then, is there? I have got a lot to give. And I like to be that cheerful, happy person. But like I say, if I can turn a new page in my life, a totally new page in my life, I don't know what that page is. Your viewers will probably have more of an idea than that, than me. I don't know how, but they probably will. Like I say, someone might be able to put me in a right path and something to totally open a new set of doors. And that's what I found as well when I got out. Didn't associate with criminals. I know lots of them. And I have had nights out with one or two of them and stuff like that. But no, don't associate in that life. But that's a good thing, because to make changes, you must change everything. Your whole outlook in life, fucking how you think, how you feel. That like You've done a fairy stretch. And like you say, you're still here to tell the tale, so you've got something to give. I say I got out when I was doing Google business classes to come top of the class of that. And entrepreneur and stuff. I, I was in the room with some serious entrepreneurs and I came first, so I think. Uh, so I was 
totally new chapter in my life that I never thought if you said to me 10 years ago, you're going to be like well into going to art galleries and buying really smart pieces of art and things like that. What? But when I go into these places, I feel so welcome and, and I can hold me home with them, you know what I mean? So at some stage I thought I was going to get out and it was going to just be a life of crime sort of again buckling the system yet again yet again yet again but the i've got a different art and a different head to that i ain't seen unnecessary violence and all that shit what violence and the drugs i hate all what comes with that and anyone in the right mind would want that you know what i mean especially someone who's got kids they'd see as a different i don't have that but as a human being, it's, you know, it's effects in everyone's life. So I want a better life, me. So instead of getting out and being in that circle, you know, when I met, met up with my mate who is a criminal, it's not a criminal relationship what we've got because some of his mates are all businessmen, never broke the law in any way whatsoever. So I've been around them, good surroundings, we've got some good people. And they're like well-to-do business people. So I can hold my own in that sense, in that environment, rather than just being in an environment full of ex-convicts. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that. I thought I could only hold my own in that environment because I've been in that environment so long. You know what I mean? Just got to add that. I still call women miss when I'm in fucking shop. And when I'm with some bird or whatever, they look at me and go, you fucking div. Miss, I like it. Yeah, prison officer, yeah, miss, can you open the door somewhere? You know, yeah, excuse me, miss. Just look at me. Yeah, but you're going to have habits from prison, man, especially with the length of time you've you've done. For anybody that's watching, Dan, that's maybe, I don't know, kind of struggling themselves, like you've spent 30 years in prison, you've got through it, you're here to tell the tale. What advice would you give for anybody that's in the struggle just now? That's free? You know, so I've never... Looks into that counselling side and shit like that, right? I've never, I, I use that word flipping the shit. I've never looked at that, right? And probably one reason is in prison, you can't speak up and say you've got a, a problem. If you're doing a, a sentence, a big sentence, it's used against you. Say, like, for instance, you was depressed. As soon as the fucking psychology gets to know you're depressed, oh, fuck me. Don't lay him out. Oh, it's going to kill someone. So you've got to keep it shut. And I was speaking to a mental health worker woman one day. Nothing about anything. Just got a, a conversation going. And uh, she said to me, you've got to be suffering from PTSD and things like that. So I said, why? She said, you've got to have. You've been through pure nothing but ordeals. Then when I was speaking to other people, like a doctor or a psychologist and people like that, they've all got the opinion as well. So I have seeked counselling, which is a first for me, you know what I mean? But it can't do me no harm. It can only bring me some good. Maybe open a different chapter in my brain. Maybe a light bulb might go off, off on me, I don't know. But on the question who's like say just getting out and drugs ain't the answer going out and getting having a binge full of coke every fucking weekend and become every day and shit like that that's not the answer uh trying to get a good home like someone said to me not long ago my mate he was getting out of jail first thing you need to do is get a good bird every time you get bird you fuck it up all right, so you don't need a good bird, you need a home, a base. So that's the thing what need, people need to start having a life, a base. I think the prison service, probation service, this is where I think it's fucking shocking. All these houses, what you, you need a guarantor for, say in Manchester for say 650, 650 quid, you can't get, because you ain't got a guarantor. But you can get one what doesn't need a guarantor for saying 650, which is a shithole. You get landlords who are renting houses out to the probation service. So you've got one house full of ex-cons. I was at probation the other day and someone was saying, yeah, you lived in my flat once. I said, yeah, I had it there. Fucking never lived in it. Lived in it once, one night. And that's an house full of 
So you'll see all your residents over a period of week sending probation. I don't think that's a good DNA, having an house full of ex-prisoners all living together. I don't. So I think anyone getting in jail and living and getting out and having that life, being around that, I think it's going to have the, they're going to have the work cut out. And these people who are going to get out and just think they're going to carry on left, left where they left off with their old mates and stuff like that. Good if it works out for them and they make loads of money, whatever, whatever, whatever floats the boat. But they might fall out and some get, get out of jail and end up on, on, on an operation next minute recall for some bullshit. They're innocent as fuck. You know, or you, like I say, you try and not put yourself in that situation. Live your fucking life. Especially, it's hard to say live your life to someone who's just done, like, say, five years because they probably don't know where I'm coming from, you know. But someone who's just done 30 years, 25 years or whatever, I think he knows where I'm coming from. As in, someone saying it's a five years. You've had nothing but shit, lad, in your life. This is a make or break time, I say. I'm 53, me, you know what I mean? I got all the worlds, oh, I got fucking years and years left in me. My dad died at 60. Healthy guy never smoked and drank. So it can come at all of us. So anyone who's getting out and they think they're going to just fall back into where they left off, I think that'll be a dead downfall. Yeah. You know what I mean? How do you feel coming on a day and telling your story? Very relaxed. Honestly, me, you. You made me feel that I, the journey where we had that made me feel good. Uh, the hospitality, what you've laid on for me, mate. Tell you what, me and my friend, we've had a beautiful morning, beautiful everything, beautiful shower, like I told you, beautiful everything. And I wouldn't have swapped this day for anything. You know what I mean? And I'm prepared for anything, me. As in, you'll get some people on here who'll cut me off like fuck. Don't really care. Don't care. I'll get someone who might like some what I say, might not. Oh, I don't really care in that sense. I'm not come on to offend people. I'm not come on to say I'm the victim. Would like a bit of justice because it is lopsided and it is unjust and it is disproportionate and things like that. But yeah, so glad I've done this today because before I seen your podcast with Alan, I never thought about doing anything like that. Someone sort of mentioned it to me and it's just gone in and out, out one in, out the other. But yeah, met a top man in you today, man. Uh, likewise, mate. Yeah. Dan, listen, for coming on and telling your story, mate, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I wish you nothing but the best for the future and for anybody that's watching, get in contact with me if you can help Darren out with anything. We're very much appreciated. I believe the guy has a chance. And like I say, mate, if you get a chance, it's all down to you how you take it or not. Yeah. Would you like to finish up on anything else, Dan? I hope I've uh, not offended anyone. Hope you've enjoyed it. I have. I've enjoyed meeting this man. And I hope all you enjoy everything else, what this man does. And if anyone else has got any positive feedback on my life, what I can do, help me out, peg me up or whatever. Investors, anyone who wants to help me read a, write a book, take the system to court, bring it on. Good man. God bless you. James, man. take care, Pop. Thank you, mate. See you later. Thank you.